Well, good morning. This is Pastor Marvin Osborne with First Baptist Church of Birmingham, Ohio. And I hope you're well today. And, and this Sunday that this is coming out is Halloween. Halloween. And we, I could have done a message on Halloween and, and uh, you know, and, and kind of gone through the whole demonic aspect of Halloween. And uh, But really, we're going to talk about something behind Halloween. And we're going to talk about Satan, our real enemy. Satan is our real enemy. And I wish I could say I planned it this way, but I really didn't. I had this series um, completed, and uh, it just so happened uh, in, the, in my scheduling, this is where this was scheduled to be, not realizing that uh, when I did this, that Halloween was falling on a Sunday this year. And, and so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about Satan. Why would we spend time talking about our enemy? Because it behooves all of us to understand who this character is and, and how come he has so much influence in the world and how, much, how come he has so much influence over us. Sun Tzu, the great uh, military general said this um, uh, hundreds of years ago. He said, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. He says, you need to know your enemy and you need to know yourself. When it comes to Satan, you and I need to know how he works and who he is, how he disguises himself as an angel of light. And we need to know ourselves. Because the Bible says our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And in truth, most of us, maybe we kind of know what our our trigger points are that causes us to sin, but we can deceive ourselves. But we need to know ourselves. So why a study on Satanism? Number one, Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. And he wants to destroy your family, uh, your 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 testimony for Jesus Christ. That's what he does. Make no mistake about it. He desires to destroy you, and we'll talk more about that. A full understanding of, of Satan and his uh, it, uh, of who he is and and his ultimate defeat should encourage believers. That you know what? There is an end. That God controls all things. He is a defeated foe and he knows it. The fact is that uh, Satan knows the Bible better than any theologian that's walking the planet today. He understands his need and he understands that his time is running out. And that should encourage you and I as well. We also need to maybe counter the myth. That Satan is not real. Uh, that he is absolutely a real uh, being. The devil is mentioned seven times in the Old, in the Old Testament books and 19 times in the, in, the, in the New Testament books. Jesus mentioned Satan 15 times. And so he is not a myth. He is not a cartoon. He is real. And as a real being that's out for your de demise, we better know more about him. We're not going to glorify him. We're not going to magnify him. We're going to understand who he is so we can defeat him in our life. Amen. And in the church. Ephesians 6, 12 says it this way. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible says we wrestle, talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, that, that, that idea that we're, this is not a paradise, this is not supposed to be our eternal reward, but you and I are in a spiritual battle with, uh, with Satan and his demonic hordes and who he influences in this world. Number two, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What's he saying? He says our enemy is really not uh, those, those foes we come in contact with on a daily basis. Our, the idea is we're here to help them come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Our real enemy is Satan. He says uh, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. 
And theologians tell us this is the hierarchy of the angelic horde, the, the demonic horde that, that follow Satan. And Satan is a military strategist. <coughs> and some believe in territorial spirits. And I'm not sure I fully believe all that, but but we understand that he, he there are certain segments of the world, certain people that that he controls and and uh, he says we wrestle not against people, but against this demonic um, horde that that is out there today. And he says he uses the word powers, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. And and theologian says this is um, possibly a reference to those who are demon possessed, those who are demon possessed. You know what? Uh, you know, we have a lot of movies out about demon possessions, and I, I really would encourage you to stay away from those things. I think you open yourself up maybe to demonic activity in your home when you do those things, when you uh, watch those movies. But, you know, demon possessions may not, um, you know, be, look like someone who is, uh, you know, uh, spewing uh, curse words and heads turning around and all this other stuff. You know what? It may be very well uh, the pastor in your pulpit. It may very well be that military man, the one that dresses so nice. and Or maybe that girl in the office that continues to come on to you. Uh, you know, demon possession, I think, shows itself in various factions. And so he says, well, our battle is not with, with, with flesh and blood, but against... Um, uh, flat, uh, principalities and, and powers, and he says the rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, those who, uh, those demons who are in charge of Satan's worldly um, business. And he says spiritual wickedness in high places. And I believe that means he's talking about those uh, who are uh, who are in charge of the worldly the demonic religions that are out there today, those who teach false religions, and we certainly look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, we look at the uh, Mormonism, we look at Seventh-day Adventists, we look at those who are teaching a false doctrine, but it also, I believe, also talks about uh, false teachers that are out there that are under the... Um, that look like us and talk like us and say they're of us, but they're teaching a damnable heresy. Maybe they have uh, a mega church or they may have a small church, but they're teaching a false doctrine. They are lies and, and pulling people into eternal hell. Uh, Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6, these are the people, those are really our enemy. Our enemy is not with man, but with Satan and his army. We realize in our in our past that we looked at, our enemy is organized, and really our enemy is all around us, isn't it? We can't, the people we, we meet in the uh, marketplace, the people we go to work with, maybe even the people we... Uh, in our family, we understand that some of them have demonic ideas, they have demonic uh, theologies, and uh, and certainly they're anti-Christ, anti-Christ. So how does the Bible describe Satan? Who is Satan? Well, number one, we know that Satan is a created being. He is not like Almighty God, who was and is and always will be. He is not the eternal one, but he, he had a beginning. It says in uh, Ezekiel twenty eight fifteen, for thou was perfect in the in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. And so we know that number one, because he is a Satan is a created being, he is not omnipotent, meaning he is not all powerful. His power is limited. His power is subject to Almighty God. We know he is not omnipresent means that he can't be with me and attacking me and attacking you at the same time. That's why he has all his his demon angels and, and ranks and, and, and working through that, that military crawlessness or that military order that he, he uses them. And he is not omniscient, meaning he is not all-knowing. He does not know everything. 
And so we see that because he's created, he has limited ability, he has limited knowledge, he has limited power, and he's limited in, in the space that he's in. Ezekiel also describes that before he fell, it, it, that he was in Ezekiel 28, 12, it says that he was wise. Uh, Twenty uh, and Chapter 28 says that he was beautiful. It says that he was holy and he was perfect in conduct. I mean, he must have been an amazing creature. And uh, some believe that he was the highest of all of, of God's angelic beings. And so he had he had a position that outranked maybe most of other uh, God's other angels there. He was wise, he was beautiful, he was holy and perfect before he fell. It says in Ezekiel 28, 14, Thou art anointed, uh, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and thou walked up and down in the midst of of the stones of fire. It says he was a an anointed cherub. God set him apart from his other angels, or most of his other angels. But it was Satan's pride, his pride that caused his downfall. We see that in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah was his, points out that it was his pride, Satan's pride. He said that I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation. I will ascend, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High God. Satan, and in his pride and his arrogance and his 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 uh, his boastfulness, says, "I will take God's throne. I will take God's throne." And he. He gathered up a third of the angels, and uh, it says in Revelation 12, 4, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, talking about angels, and cast them to the earth. And so uh, God, you know, t takes this rebellion of this of this created thing, and certainly Satan and his, his angelic hordes are no match for Almighty God, and God casts them out of, out of heaven wasn't much of a uh, of that uh, of a rebellion because God had no problem expelling them from Satan so if God cast them out of Satan I mean cast them out of heaven now where is Satan where, where does he reside today well we know from job chapters 1 and chapter 2 that uh, that he has access to heaven remember that he came and presented himself he has the answer to Almighty God he made accusation about Job, and God allowed him to do certain things to Job within within reason. So we know he, he has access. It's not his home anymore. He does not reside there, but he has access uh, to the throne room of God, or at least to the presence of God in some form or fashion. But it's seemingly, we see in Job chapter 1 and also 1 Peter 5, 8, that planet Earth seems to be where uh, Satan resides. No, we could make we could probably make some uh, surmise certain things about where he may be living. He may be living in the White House today, or he may be living in in the Vatican, or he may be living in over in Iraq somewhere, or in Russia somewhere. Um, but he's here on planet Earth. But we do know we don't. Although we don't know where he is today, we know his demise. Uh, what, where his future home will be, because we see that in Revelation 20.10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10. So although Satan may at this point have access Satan to heaven, we see that Satan primarily re resides on planet Earth, but one day, God will throw him into the place of his uh, eternal home, which will be in the lake of fire, in the lake of fire. So people will ask, since God created Satan, did God create evil? Let me say this uh, very clear. God did not create evil at all.
It says in Matthew 7, 18, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. <laughs> God is incapable of creating evil because it is outside of who he is. And yet God created the angels, just like he did created man um, uh, with, a, uh, with the ability of, of, of a free moral will. That they can pick and choose whether they're going to obey God or not. Because God did not create us to be robots. And it was Satan. And it was those third of the angels. And just like it was, it is our, um, our will to rebel against God. It was their decision. So man, man and angels were created without sin. And it was because of our rebellion our desires, our evil desires that we fell, it was our own choice. Our own choice. Certainly not God's will. So, how is Satan described in the Bible? How is he described in the Bible? Well, remember when we were talking about the names uh, uh, of God and, and we said that names revealed God's character? Well, the same is true. Names have meaning in the Bible. And when we read a name in the Bible of, of Satan, it also reveals a, a, a portion of their character, of his character, of who he is. So we can glean from his name and the meanings of those names that God is describing this evil, demonic uh, character that we all should be aware of. His first name is used 52 times is the name Satan. Satan, which is really a title. A Satan, so to speak. Satan, which means hater, enemy, or adversary. Used 52 times. He is a hater. He is the enemy. He is the uh, 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 adversary. Um, he is, uh, he hates, get this, he is an equal opportunity hater. He hates uh, you. He hates me. He hates God. And you know what? He even hates those who follow him. He hates everyone. And that's just part of who he is. People, you know, you hear these people who sacrifice to Satan. They, they will kill themselves for Satan. And they think that somehow that they're going to garner a special place in hell because they're living their life for Satan. Listen, Satan hates them too. And they, he, they believe Satan's lie, thinking that Satan's going to rule and reign in hell. And he's not. He's going to be tormented day and night. Day and night. Satan hates you, and he hates the followers of, of, of himself. He hates Jesus and, his fo and, and uh, those who follow Satan as well. It's also called the devil. The devil. And this is used 35 times. 35 times. And the name devil means slanderer or accuser. And we saw that in the book of Job, chapter 1, when he came up and he began to accuse, he began to accuse Job. Which says in Zechariah 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist, or really to accuse, that's a better translation, to, to accuse him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee, is not this brand plucked out of the fire. He's accuser. He is the accuser of the brethren. He stands and he accuses you. And he accuses you, but thank God if you're saved, you're under the blood of the Lamb, and God has saved you from your past and your present and your future sin. That you are adopted into the family of God, and as, as uh, Romans chapter 8 says, that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. But he's an accuser. He's a slanderer. He maligns our character. And that, that be a, um, maybe that's why uh, we see over and over again that we're not supposed to gossip, slander other people, spread rumors about other people because we're being like Satan. You should watch that, especially if we have an ear that's, that kind of uh, tingles when we hear some juicy gossip about someone else. Number three, it's called the Prince 
of the power of the air. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You think about that prince of the power of the air. We think of the radio. We think about television. We think about uh, what's happening with movies and and uh, the internet and the cloud and all these things that are out there today. He's saying that, that Satan, that is his dominion. That's what he controls. It used to be a time where if someone had a proclivity for pornography, that they would, uh, you know, they would have to go to maybe the seediest parts of town to get it. But not today. Any uh, 10-year-old can turn on the television see, uh, and see pornography, see nudity, and see uh, and access all kind of depravity on the Internet today without their parents not notice. And they say, well, I have a filter on there. Those kids are smart enough now to get around the filters that are out there. He's the prince of the power of the air. And he can, uh, that's why we see so much of this insidious uh, stuff going on today. We don't, he's also called the God, the small g, the God of this age. And uh, it says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So we wonder why people can believe what they believe and how they spew these these unbelievable unbelievable they believe so much <coughs> excuse me and they, they they you know things that just don't make sense you think about evolution you think about uh global warming you think about getting rid of the fossil fuels you think about all these things and it doesn't make sense we have a president who stopped the pipeline and and but we're importing oil from uh, uh other parts of the world it's costing us more money to bring it in from um, from other parts of the world when we have access to oil right now. It doesn't make sense when it makes sense to them because their eyes are blind. They're, open, they're blind to the truth of God and his words. He claims to be a believer and by his actions, he is not. Those who believe these lies. He's called the prince of this world. The prince of this world, he controls really what's happening in Russia, what's happening in China, what's happening in, in the world today, really, um, with limited power because God is still sovereign. He's called the ruler of darkness. We see this in Ephesians 6.12. Uh, uh, we Certainly the spiritual darkness. He's called a Leviathan in Isaiah 27, verse 1. That was a, uh, the theologians would believe that was a powerful water uh, dinosaur, dinosaur-like monster that uh, swam in the waters, um, you know, during, dur you know, centuries ago. It's uh, the idea that he is vicious, he is dangerous, he is strong, he is formidable, and we need to be aware of him. He is a Leviathan. He is called Lucifer. Lucifer, we see that in Isaiah 14, 12, which means light bearer. He is a shining one. He is the morning star. Uh, it says in Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Ah, before his fall, he must have been a beautiful uh, creature. But certainly he wouldn't be described that way today. He's also described as the lion, as a dragon in uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And that's this, and there was war in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, um, uh, 7 through 9. And so he's a dragon, and he's a great big monster, like uh, able to destroy. And uh, we continue on. He's called the deceiver in Reve uh, Revelation 20, 10. And... Uh, so he's the deceiver. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of 
fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. And he's a deceiver. He he puts a veil over people's eyes. He blinds them. He 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 thinks he he has people believing that somehow they have to work their way into heaven, that this is the right way, that somehow all paths lead to to heaven, and that's simply not true. It didn't even make sense. But he's deceived the world. That's why Ephesians 6 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickery, or the deceptions of the devil. Listen, if we're not on guard, if we don't know the truth, uh, we're going to be deceived. That's why the Bible is so important to us. He's also called Apollyon, uh, meaning the destroyer. We see that in Revelation 9 1 through 11. It's called Beelzebub, meaning the prince of demons. Uh, Beelzebub can also be translated the, the god of the small g, the, the god of the flies, or the dung god. I like that one. The, the dung god, the excrement god, you could say. Matthew 12, 24. And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He's called Belial, which means vile, or worthless, or ruthless. He is uh, found in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 14 and 15. And the warning there, remember it's talking about being unequally yoked. And he says, why would a believer be yoked with sons of Belial? With uh, with with people that are worthless, uh, with those who are um, uh, are, are 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 ruthless, we have nothing to do with them. It's called the wicked one. We see that in in uh, Matthew thirteen thirty eight through thirty nine when Jesus warns us to beware that Satan will plant his his. Um, the wicked one will come and plant his false uh, believers in with the saints. And that's really what's happening today because he says, really, if you pour out the, the, the tares uh, that disguise themselves as wheat, as true believers, that you also pull out some of the believers as well. And so they become so part of ingrained in the, in, 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 in Christendom, these false teachers that if you start pulling them out, pulling them out, you're also going to pull other people out with them. It's called the tempter. First uh, uh, Thessalonians three five, and uh, for this cause, when I should, could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have come and tempted you, and your our labor is in vain. The tempter. We're all familiar with that. Is that right? He's called the accuser of the brethren. We've just talked about that a little bit ago, uh, that he stands in Revelation 12, 10. And uh, it says that he's, he accused the brethren day and night. He's uh, constantly accusing you. He's, the sky, he's also called the angel of light, 2 Thessalonians 11, 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. In other words, he's going to talk like us. He's going to act like us, but he's not going to be part of us. We have to understand that the devil is a liar. He's a deceiver, and he will disguise himself so he can fool us because we don't know the truth. So many people pulling people away from the Bible. Why are these pastors pulling people away from the Bible? They should be encouraging them to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to memorize the Bible. It's called a murder, John 8, 44. Year of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Why? He's a murderer because, because of his deceptions, his lies to Eve, Eve um, and Adam's uh, desire to, uh, to believe Satan's lies that death came upon all men. He's, a, he's also called a liar. It says, for he is a liar and the father of it. John 8, 44. Certainly see that when he deceived the angels to fall. And certainly we saw that in the garden. He's called the enemy. It says the enemy that sowed them is the devil. 
in Matthew 13, 39, and uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, he's called a roaring lion. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In my mind, that's the one I can kind of picture and understand. You know, we see these, we see these, um, when I was growing up on Sunday night, you would have the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Remember that? As you were growing up on Sunday nights, and you would watch this, and, and they would show these different animals. And I kind of picture this lion, and this lion sees this gazelle, and he's he looks for the weakest, he looks for the most vulnerable, and then he attacks. We're supposed to not be that weak and vulnerable believer in Jesus Christ, where Satan thinks he can come and devour us. That's why the Bible is so important to us. So over and over again, we have these descriptors. We have... 21 different descriptors of who Satan is. Why would God in his 66 books give us 21 descriptors and many times used over and over again? Why would he do that? Because he's our enemy. And we have to understand that he's out to destroy you. He's out to destroy your family. He's out to destroy your testament. He's out to destroy the church. We need to be aware. Stop sticking our hand, heads in the sand and understand that he's, he's going to find a vulnerable point in your life and he will exploit it and he will destroy you. You need to stay tethered to the word of God. There is no substitute. You need to be in church. You need to make that a priority in your life. You need to make sure your children and your grandchildren and your spouse is in church. Or Satan will use that, that boy sweet-talking your, your daughter at school and, and cause her to fall that way. Or he'll, he'll, he'll introduce them to drugs and sex and alcohol and the pornography and or just the, the vileness of of covetousness and the desire or pride or, or anger or fighting and those things. And and just being in church doesn't guard them. But boy, I tell you what, I believe there's a protection of uh, for the people of God when they humbly and they hungrily come to the house of God to hear from God. We need to be aware. Isn't that the purpose of this? Our God is not defeated. We serve a risen Savior. God is still on his throne. If we humble ourselves before him, he will answer us. If we call unto him, he will show us great and mighty things that we know not. We understand that we are the victors. We're not victims. Through Jesus Christ, Satan will be defeated and we will be rewarded. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll pick back up on this next week. And uh, if some you know somebody that needs this message, pass it on to them. Share it with them. Put it, paste it on your on your page so that other people can glean onto it. Let me ask you this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, make no mistake about it, you're not going to heaven. You're going to die and go to eternal hell. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, died on the cross for your sins. He is the propitiation for your sins. He is the payment, the satisfaction for your sins. If you choose to receive him as your Savior, are you saved? Are you born again? Do you want to be? The Bible says, call unto me, and I will answer thee. And I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Why don't you come and confess your sins to Almighty God. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and he will save you. Why don't you say, dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me of my sins and come into my life and save me now and save me forever. Make me eternally yours. I believe in Jesus. In your precious name I pray, amen. Amen? Amen. This is Pastor Marvin Osborne saying, God loves you, and I love you as well.
and I'll talk to you soon.